conclude tonight our study on prayer. And there are two things I'd like to do in conclusion. Uh, the first one is, I have saved what I consider the most important lesson on prayer for the last. Not the first, the last. Because if tonight's lesson is not practiced by us, then everything else, it's like pulling the foundation block of the building. So I'm going to talk tonight about private prayer. Private prayer. I think by now you can guess what my verse is going to be. Matthew 6, 6. But thou, when thou prayest, and to thy closet, shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. I think our private time alone with the Lord in Bible study and prayer is the foundation that everything else is built on. Mm -hmm. our, our church service, our teaching, our singing, our praying for others, our public praying, you go right down the line. And I want to remind you that in, in, the, in the Hebrew and in the Greek, the word service, most of the time, meant worship. And when, you, and when you remember that our service is actually worship, how God looks at our service, then you can see where if none of this is has the foundation of our private walk and life with the Lord under it, you, you can see where that would be a problem. So, very simple tonight. Matter of fact, both things I will do. Matter very simple, but this will be the conclusion to uh, what uh, I don't know what two months I have been kept up with it. Uh, number one, the the obvious illustration of private prayer is the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are told in First John two six, He that saith he abideth in Him ought himself so to walk even as Jesus walked. A study, a complete study, which I haven't done, but a complete study of the Lord's prayer life in those three years of public ministry is very revealing. Uh, it's very interesting. For example, he began every major adventure of his public ministry with an extended season of private prayer. Secondly, he ended every successful adventure with private prayer. He valued his private time with his father above everything. And everything he did publicly was a, an outflow of his private time with his father. For example, Mark 135, rising up in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out into a solitary place and there prayed. And that's not the only one. He began the day in private with the Lord. In Luke 6, 12, he went out into a mountain and continued all night in prayer to God. The last prayer meeting, when he and his men were in the garden before they arrested him, 
he went so far into the garden, told his men to watch and pray, and they went to sleep. And it says this, he went a little farther alone and prayed, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. You, if you're saved and you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you cannot develop this private time alone with your Heavenly Father, with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and then not make a difference in your life. It just, it has to show. The Apostle Paul, and I'll just tell the story because I don't want to take that long, in Acts chapter, and, and when you, and there are over a hundred prayer references to the Apostle Paul in his public ministry for over 30 years. Now the Apostle Paul obviously had prayer time, private prayer time, that you and I don't have in that he was incarcerated so much of his time. So there wasn't any problem. He didn't have to look very far to be alone. His enemies took care of that by putting him in jail. But there's one specific incident that speaks volumes about his life. And that's when he was arrested by the Roman government and put on a ship to go to Rome. And the story is told in Acts chapter 27. And if you'll remember, it was at the wrong time of year. And uh, the summer breezes were coming to an end and the fall storms were starting. And he told the captain, he said, don't do it. And the captain listened to the owner of the ship who had merchandise to sell. It was a money decision on that ship, which didn't do him any good because they had to throw it all over because they sailed right into a storm. Paul said, don't do it, but they did it anyway. And of course, they went right into it. They called it a Eurocliton. It's what, it's, what, it's what you and I would call um, a, a cyclone, which you and I today would call hurricane. And there were 250, 60 men on board. And at, at a certain point in time, after three days of that going on, and they dumped everything overboard, the light and the load, did everything they could and find it. It was determined, finally they just gave up and said, well, we're not going to make it. And a ship of men, most of them prisoners, by the way, just knew they were going to die. Paul was absent. Paul wasn't up there with everybody else. He was down in the belly of the ship. Alone. Well, trust me, he was not taking a nap. <laughs> finally he came up and uh, he spoke, and he said, uh, there stood by me the angel of God. And he told me, I'll show them. We're going to make it. There'll be no loss of any man's life, only of the cargo, and we're going to make it. One man praying saved a shipload yeah. of people. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how words like that need to be embellished. How obvious that our private walk with God uh, is just that important. Now, Matthew 6.6 6 is a natural four-point outline. But thou when thou prayest to enter thy closet, shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, my Father would see in secret shall reward thee openly. There are four things. And number one, there's a special habit that we as believers need to work on our whole life. When ye pray. When ye pray. Not if, not maybe, not if you have time, but when ye pray. There's no other way to put this other than folks, uh, as believers, there have to be some priorities of a Christian nature in our lives, and one of those priorities is that somehow, some way, we develop the habit of daily prayer. Paul 
said something in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. Very important principle. But I keep unto my body and bring it into subjection, lest I by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The biggest obstacle to your private prayer life is not anybody or anything out there. It's the, it's the temple of clay you live in. It's the tent of clay you live in. You're too tired to get out of bed in the morning. And of course, by the time you come in from a day's work, especially those of us out here in this hot Texas, you're drained. You don't want to pray. You're hungry. You're thirsty. You're tired. Your, TV, your favorite TV show's coming on. Paul said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Now, there isn't anything easy about that. Our bodies like to be pampered, and we like to pamper our bodies. Amen? Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and say amen. <laughs> I, live in one of those, I live in one of those ugly things, too. <laughs> A special habit. When you pray, number two, a selected place. Enter into my closet. Now, of course, not literally. Now, when I was a kid, a closet was a little thing that had a, 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 a rod across and you hung your clothes on. Today, closets are rooms. <laughs> so, maybe today you could go into your closet. The point is privacy. Yes. Privacy. Testimony at this point. I went to see my retired missionary friend Ray Lovin today at uh, nursing home in uh, Cleveland, and uh, yes, the car did break down in front of Rome, so let's get that out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> that little blue car just it sees a Brom, and it just... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, they said his mind would never be right again, and, and he would, you know, he would just be... Well... Dr. Jesus had better ideas. He's back in his right mind, just as clear Amen. as anything could be. Now, he's in a wheelchair. He can't walk, so he can't leave the nursing home. But you know, if God wants him to preach again, God can fix that too. Amen. But, but he said something that he said, this would agree with me. I'm going to tell you something. I have not opened the Bible since the day I've come here, which has been three months now. now I understand a lot of the time he could, but now he could. I said, well, what's the problem? He said, the noise. The noise. I mean, there's TVs going everywhere. There's people in that room, all the noise, the confusion. I said, don't they have a reading room in this facility? He said, I don't know. He said, well, you're a paying customer. Why don't you ask for the manager to come in and you tell us, so tell her this place needs a reading room that not everybody watches TV. So let's pray that when he talks to the manager, they have a reading room where they can study their Bible. The point is, the Bible says you need some place that's quiet for a little while where you're not being disturbed, right. where you can read your Bible. By the way, if you got a place like that, thank God for it. Amen. It's a little <clears throat> place to pray. Brainerd, the great missionary to the North American Indians, North Dakota, in zero degree weather, would bundle up because there was no privacy at all and go out in the woods. He was 36 years old, and one day, the dead of winter, he went out there to pray because it's the only time that he could be alone. And when he didn't come back, some of the Indians went to see about him, and they found him on his knees, frozen to death. Folks, we got it so easy. 
described it so easy. Selectively. Number, th number, uh, number three, a secret silence when thou shut the door. The going, the activity, the noise of the world will drown out the voice of God. God said, be still and know that I'm God, Psalm 46, 10. God said to Elijah, you're going to see that earthquake, I'm not in that. You're, not, you're going to see the volcano, I'm not in that. You're going, to, you're going to see that wind, I'm not there. And then you're going to hear a little, still, small voice, that's why I am. Selective silence. And number four, a prayer that must be serious. Pray to thy Father, which is in secret. Paul said to Timothy, give thyself wholly to it. I have not yet made this offer here, but I'll, I'll make it now. In the 1800s, there was a man by the name of George Mueller of Bristol, England. He was the first worldwide traveling preacher. He was the first worldwide track ministry. He printed millions of tracks, distributed them worldwide. But his main thing was he had half a dozen orphanages. After the black plagues uh, of Europe, there were just thousands and tens of thousands of orphanages. So he raised personally with his people about 10,000 orphans in his life. Never, <coughs> never <coughs> one time did he ask anybody for a dime. George Mueller would spend the first couple of hours of the day alone praying. Praying over how he should go and what, what to do. God supplied out of one man's private prayer life, 10,000 orphans were raised and fed. There is a book called George Muir of Bristol. I know where to get it. It's not an expensive book. I would sure recommend it. If anybody wants it, you let me know. I'll call the soul of the Lord and I'll get it. There are stories in that book that just thrill you. I'll tell you one. The ladies at one of the orphanages were, it was the main orphanage where George Mueller had his study, came to him and said, uh, at night, said, uh, we, don't, we don't have any food. We don't, we don't have anything for the morning. No milk, no milk, no nothing. And he said, I'll pray. In the morning, the ladies came to George Mill and said, we still don't have any. We don't need to feed the kids this morning. Mr. Mueller said, I've been praying. Go ahead and bring them all into the dining room and set them down. But, and they protested. They said, well, we don't have anything. Mr. Mueller said, God will take care of it. They set the children down in front of an empty table. And about that time, there was a knock on the door. One of the ladies went to the door. And there was a man standing at the door that said, my milk truck is broken now. It's all going to ruin me. Isn't this an orphanage? Yes. Could you use all the stuff on that wagon? And the children were fed. I know to us, that's the kind of stuff we make into a movie. We don't really believe that God does that kind of stuff. But shame on us. Because he does. That's what you can do. With a, with, a, uh, with a good private prayer life. Now, in, in conclusion to 
private prayer I'm going to say a few things uh, I want you to know our father's discerning disposition thy father which seeth in secret God knows where you are when you're praying and then our father's response shall reward thee I started out by talking to you about the prayer life of the early church. And I said that was their power. Folks, I got news for you. It still is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Still is. <clears throat> Let me close by making some personal observations, if I may do that. Paul made, made the statement in Philippians 4 11. He said, I have learned. Of course, what he learned was, I've learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. He could be hungry, he could be full. He could have money, he could be broke. He could be free, he could be in prison. Uh, he could write, he could not write. He's learned as an old man. In whatsoever state or wherever he was, I have learned to be content. I'd like to take that little statement, I have learned. Personally and in many years of pastoring, I've learned some things about it. The prayer life of church members. Observation. Number one, I, I kind of put this in a strange way, but you'll understand what I mean. Good time Charlies don't pray. You know what a good time Charlie is? Back slapping, he all laughing, carrying on. Uh, no time, uh, funny all the time, never serious bone in his body, busy, 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 go, go, go. Uh, blowing and going. Good time Charlie's going to pray. I've learned number two. Lazy people don't pray. By the way, it's true. You want to get a job done right, get somebody that's busy. Lazy people don't pray. I've learned number three. Selfish people don't pray. They're too full of themselves. I've learned number four, undisciplined people don't pray. Our life is a stewardship from God. We are responsible to live our lives orderly. Do what we have to do before doing what we want to do. Undisciplined people don't pray. I've learned the next, broken people pray. Broken people pray. One of the great problems, and God, will, and only God can fix it, and if God wants to, in his time, he will. And no tears today. The broken people pray. I've learned that great prayer warriors are very private people. Spend time alone. How about Moses, 40 years in the desert? How about Samuel, for years alone before God <coughs> sent him out? How about Elijah? You analyze Elijah's life. Did you know his public life only took up 10%? 90% was in private. Paul, when he got saved and the Holy Spirit came in and his eyes were open to the truth of the Bible, first thing he did, he went back home to Tarsus for three years studying and praying. I've learned that uh, praying people are home. Because see, prayer says, I can't, God can. The rule for good praying is humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. We've got to be empty so He can show us humbleness. Broken people move the hand of God. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, Thou wilt not despised. And then finally, and 
most obviously, prayer just gets done what nothing else can get done. So, one of the most serious verses in the Bible is Ezekiel 22, 30. I saw, God, God was talking to Israel, he said, I saw for men among the, among the nations that would make up the head, in other words, pray, that I should not destroy the land, but I found not. Now folks, that's just got to be one of the saddest verses, if not the saddest verse in the Bible. Look, we don't need any more complaining. We don't need any more griping. We don't need any more busloads of church members going to Washington or Austin to march. We don't need any more people picketing in front of abortion clinics. We need Christians in private on their knees. Amen. 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 <coughs> and folks, I believe that to the depth of my Amen. I'm done. Or two. <laughs> <laughs>